All right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Happy to have y'all here. Uh, welcome to another edition of Hashtag FFT Live presented by Fitter and Faster Swim Camps. Uh, we've got a really, really cool show planned for you guys today. It's all about the iconic 1996 Team USA medley relay that won gold at the Atlanta, Olymp El excuse me, Atlanta Olympics. And I have to make an admission right off the bat. I'm pretty nervous for this one. I've done a lot of these and most of them I don't get nervous for it. But uh, this particular one, I'm super nervous because I have not had a whole lot of uh, experience interviewing first off a whole panel of people, secondly, having them be four Olympic legends like y'all. So um, we have here today with us Jeff Rouse, Jeremy Lin, Mark Henderson, and Gary Hall Jr. Um, everybody in chat, give them a warm welcome. How are you guys? Doing awesome. Yeah, great. Hello. Stoked to have you guys here. Um, happy Sunday. Thank you guys for volunteering a little bit of your time. Um, you know, the obvious question to ask just to get like get us started is sort of uh, how are you guys weathering the quarantine and do you, like are things starting to loosen up where you guys are right now? Jeff, you're the backstroker. You should start. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. If you got to turn your audio on, bud. Sorry, first technical difficulty. Uh, I think we're weathering as good as we can. I, mean, I can see we've all got our, uh, you know, Corona beards going. Um, but it, everyone's going a little stir crazy, too, ready to get back to some sense of normalcy. For sure. Jeremy? Yeah, so uh, I know that, uh, you know, Virginia's kind of split a little bit. The further north you get and towards D.C., uh, a little tighter the restrictions are and, and pretty interestingly with with our swim club most of our swim club falls under the uh the, the uh, tenets of being a little more restricted as far as what phase one means and so you know we we can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel we just uh we're, we're uh getting there slower and slower and uh we really want to get our, our kids back in the pool uh so uh, looking forward to uh a, a healthy transition in, into everyday life again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure we all are. And that kind of takes care of like the, the East Coast of the states. And uh, now we go to the West Coast. Mark, what about you? How things look up in Oregon? Your, your audio is off too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, Oregon's near the bottom of the number of cases uh, per state, so that's good. Um, the mountain just opened up yesterday, so kind of keeping our fingers crossed that we don't get a surge after that happened. But all Absolutely. And Gary, how are uh, things look down in the L.A. area? L.A. is still uh, locked down in a lot of ways. Uh, new restrictions, um, stay-at-home orders through uh, August now, um, face mask whenever you step outside at all. And uh, so, yeah, but they did open the beaches. Um, you can't sit. I think you have to keep moving and keep your distance. But uh, we're still in the wait-and-watch couch position we've been holding for a long time. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's been interesting because obviously right now, a lot, you know, most states are in some form of in between between, you know, like New York and L.A., which seem to be kind of the most locked down and, and Georgia, which is basically, you know, semi back to normal with social distancing put in. Right. So um, the, the nice thing is, is that, you know, we're already starting to see some glimmers of hope. Things are getting kind of sort of back to normal and hopefully things continue that way. Um, but to get all that out of the out of the way in the beginning is great. Um, so obviously you guys were a part of a really, really huge event in 1996, but I want to back up the clock even more and get to kind of like the early years. And I'd like to hear from each of you, you know, um, how, when and where you started swimming and, you know, what your first memory is, good or bad, of the pool. Backstroker first. <laughs> um, well, we, my, my family lived literally two houses from the local pool, you know, a little five lane, 25 yard pool. Um, so my friends and I were pool rats during the summer. Uh, and I started swimming summer league, like probably all of us did, um, young age five or six. Um, 
started year round swimming when I was 10 and kind of went, went from there. Um, the Mark, Mark and I weren't in the same area, but we, as we got older in our 13, 14, 15 year old days, we were at the same meets and, and competing against each other as well. But uh, that goes back a long way, doesn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Back when we wore patch jackets. <laughs> Jeremy, what about you? Well, and, it, and it's a it's a fun connection I find with with uh, uh, you know uh, both Jeff and Mark because now I coach for the club that Mark grew up swimming on, and when I started in Northern Virginia, I coached for the club that Jeff grew up swimming on. So I feel this awesome connection to to what they had when they were growing up swimming. Uh, I'm from Central Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I was on a real small inner city team for a club. Uh, I started summer league just probably a lot like everybody else and most of the folks that are listening to this call. Um, I started swimming because my big brother and big sister swam and I had more energy than both of them put together. So they had to do something with me. So they put me in the pool too. I was four years old and my first memory is uh, of, of a race. I can recall very well because, uh, you know, they, they set me up on the box and it was a long time ago. So they shot guns into the air to start the race and I was four. So that was pretty scary. And uh, <laughs> all the kids dove in except for me when I started crying on the block. Which these three know that's probably very reasonable. And then uh, <laughs> then my coach shoved me in and I swam to the other side and I started crying again. So, um, you know, that's that was pretty much how, how the old swimming career got going. <laughs> awesome. Mark, what about you? I was about eight or nine and playing a variety of sports, and I collapsed on the basketball court and couldn't get up. And so they um, brought me to the hospital and found out that I didn't have enough cartilage in my major joints. So like Jeremy, I was full of energy, and my mom – I uh, was like, there's no way he's sitting at home. So they threw me in a pool. And that's when I started training year round. And I was one of the, I'd say, first couple hundred guys that joined the club that Jeremy's coaching right now. And Jeff King was my coach. And, you know, thank God he made things fun for me and got me over a hurdle of, you know, feeling sorry for myself that I couldn't play the other sports. So that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. And Gary, how did you start? Yeah, my dad was a swimmer. Uh, my mom was a swimmer. Uh, they met at a swim meet, um, had six kids, and we were all swimmers. So it's just something that we all did. And uh, I didn't join a year-round program until about 13. I uh, did a summer league a couple of times and uh, had some fun with it. But uh, was had the opportunity to play a lot of other sports at a, at a really high graduated level. but. Uh, to sample everything as, as uh, a younger kid, I, I feel like it uh, ultimately uh, helped me make a, a larger commitment to the sport of swimming when it was time. That's a, sure. yeah. like a pretty common thread because, you know, me as well, I played I played baseball and soccer until I was 15, and, and they decided, you know, we can't take you to all these practices, so you're going to have to pick one. I remember picking them, like, counted the trophies in my room, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm a swimmer. <laughs> not not realizing I, I swam all year round. I got two trophies a year and only one from the other sports. But uh, it was good. I'm glad. I <laughs> That's awesome. And I, my so my story on how I got started swimming is a little bit different. So um, I'm like the first person in my whole extended family to have ever you know become a swimmer. And um, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And my family and I who we're all from Southern California. We used to go to the river quite quite a lot and we had a boat and my parents decided that if anything crazy were to happen and the boat were to flip over or whatever, my mom would grab my sister, my dad would grab my brother and I had to learn how to swim, <laughs> which I feel like is a good thing considering they swim like rocks. But, um, you know, one of my one of my first memories of like my first meet, I was on a small parks and recreation team, which is kind of like a summer league team in a way. But I remember my very first swim meet, um, you know, I was getting ready to swim the 25 freestyle and I was behind, you know, the obviously the opposite side of the pool because it's a short course pool where the blocks are not. And, you know, I remember my coach told me I was in lane six 
like he said, like I think he said heat three, lane six or whatever. So I just go stand behind lane six, had no clue what a heat was. So I was just standing behind lane six and these other people getting up like, uh, excuse me, it's my turn to go. I was like, no, I'm in lane six. And I had to be told four or five times to step back so the other person could swim. So that's my humble beginnings in the sport. Um, but, you know, we've obviously talked about a little bit already. Um, you know, we've talked about your families and, you know, sort of how each person on the call has a different sort of connection with their family as it relates to swimming. You know, um, how supportive or not was your family with, um, you know, your swimming aspirations? Were they, you know, was it more of a situation in which your parents were like forcing you to swim and you kind of learned to love it after the fact, or was it kind of something else? Uh, well, no, I, I mean, my parents were uh, like all of ours, I'm sure were very supportive, you know, carpool parents and uh, never forced. I never felt pressured to swim. And, and like you all mentioned, did multiple sports up until I got to be a freshman uh, in high school. And that's when I made the decision to um, leave anything else behind and, and just swim. But um, I mean, I can recall when I was in that 13 year old range and just had a tough year for a lot of the same reasons. Most 13 year olds have tough years and really considered quitting. Um, we were carpooling, we were traveling a long way to the pool at the time, a uh, long ride. And my parents didn't force me. They said, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. And um, it just went away. I just, you know, so they, if they had tried to pressure me into, you know, staying, I might have revolted a little bit. Um, they didn't. They just continued to be supportive and, and, and left the decision up to me. And thankfully, I guess the desire to quit just ultimately disappeared. So, um, and obviously great teammates and coaches that, that helped throughout that as well. Yeah. That's such a great point. Um, Jeremy, what about you? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I think anybody that, that goes through the work, uh, and the dedication, the time commitment that it takes to be a swimmer and do things at a high level, um, you know, especially when they're going through their teenage years, considers, uh, uh, you know, discontinuing the sport and maybe multiple times. Uh, so for me, multiple times, so, you know, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And, and the support in the way my, my parents gave it to me, you know, we didn't come up with uh, my family didn't have much money. So when they committed financially to do something, they were going to hold you accountable to carry it through and see it through. So it's kind of the message was, you can quit, but you're going to see through your commitment until the end of the season. And when it's all said and done, go ahead and, and you make your decision. And, and, and by and large, every single time you'd finish that season, so you'd stick to it and go to every practice. And you finish the season, you do real well, and you'd be like, yeah, that was, that was worth it, and I'll do it again. So, you know, really, you know, the support was more on let's hold you accountable to what matters. And that's, you know, honoring a commitment. So I thought that that was a really important lesson that my, my family gave to me along the way. That is a great lesson. I feel like it's one that, you know, in general, swimmers all sort of experience, you know, uh, swimming in general, like I feel like is not a very glamorous sport, but it's pure in that you get out of it exactly what you put into it. And I feel like most swimmers work pretty hard. So a lot of times you get to the end of the season, you know, obviously, unless you're dealing with a plateau or injury, a lot of times you work hard during the season and you reap those benefits at the end. So you're going to look at these four guys and say swimming's not glamorous. I don't even get it. <laughs> well, OK, so to make that argument, I actually would love to argue with you on this. So if, if you if any one of the five of us were to have been able to take our world ranking and and transition that in a parallel way into NFL, NBA, you know, a lot of these other sports, there would be a lot more like press and notoriety to it. But I think the the beauty of swimming is that it's, it's so pure in that, you know, we have such an incredibly passionate and, and loyal group that's just all about swimming and what we do. And there's no, you know, and because it's very individual in a lot of ways, of course, outside of relays, like it's it's very clear on who who the you know the high level people are, and it's very um, I just feel like it's not really adulterated because of the way the sport is. So that's just my opinion. 
Agreed. Um, Mark, what about you? Um, I think you're going to see a lot of consistency with the athletes here on the call. I mean, my parents were the same. My parents were super supportive. Um, they instilled that if I started a season in a certain sport that I was going to show up to the practices that I committed to. And the one cool thing like, when I look back is they never pitted me against anybody. They never you know, pointed out that I should beat somebody. They never got on me or even gave me suggestions on how I could swim. I mean, my mom was the one who swam in the pool that never got her hair wet. So there was never really anybody <laughs> coming at me with suggestions yeah. on how to do stuff, right? Or, you know, what I should have done at the end of the race or what I should have done during the race. So I was super fortunate because if I look back on my career, I saw a lot of guys with a lot more potential than me, whether they were taller or had better strokes or stronger at a younger age that had crazy parents like yelling at them and doing all this stuff. So, you know, I felt that they dropped out a lot earlier and had a lot more potential. Yeah. Agreed. And, and of all the of, of all of us on the call, I'm actually curious to hear Gary's answer on this the most because he comes from a family of swimmers. And I feel like the other four of us didn't relate to some level. So, Gary, what about you? How is your family support system in swimming? Uh, there were great expectations, you know, uh, and fortunately it wasn't coming from my family. Uh, you know, I think that there were a lot of people that were aware of my dad's reputation in the sport. He was this workhorse out of Doc Councilman's legendary Indiana program, roommates with Mark Spitz, uh, teammates with him on a couple games, and um, it, it just uh, it, well known in the sport of swimming. And so, you know, I, I, growing up, um, there were a lot of people that would come up to me and say, oh, I swam with your dad, or I knew him, but we used to compete against each other down in Long Beach uh, back in the day. or and. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that would have come across more as pressure if, if my dad was there kind of pushing me the way we've seen other parents push in unhealthy ways. Um, you know, his advice to me through my career was have fun. Um, I, I definitely heard that uh, you finish what you start, you know, that if you're signing up for this season, you're going to see this thing through, that good thing. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, you know, put in that time and effort. And, and no matter how good my, my, my parents were in the sport of swimming, you know, that wasn't something that they could hand me. It was something that they had, that I had to earn on my own. And that's what they wanted for me, not uh, the work ethic, the goal orientation, and all the good qualities that you, you get from that, you know, that, that type of commitment to sport. Um, they weren't, uh, initially, uh, there was no indication that I would be a, a fast swimmer. So the expectations that I carry on and follow in his footsteps uh, were, were pretty small uh, coming from him. Um, well, and, and that's, um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I feel like the more I ask people that question, you know, I get a lot of, at least the people who make it to a really high level, I feel like it's, it's a lot of the same. They had parents who were were supportive but not overbearing they weren't helicopter parents like some people know them to be they just hover the whole time over, over their kids and i feel like the the parent the parental units that end up being the most probable at being successful in terms of having kids that are successful in their sport whatever that success means because that's a very relative term are the ones that focus more on instilling a love for the sport and instilling um, you know, the, the desire and adventure of creating a, a really healthy relationship between themselves and their coaches instead of constantly coming in and second guessing what the coach and the program is doing. Um, but I, I just find that really interesting because I do ask that question to a lot of people, um, you know, and a lot of people that I've swam with in the past, as I'm sure that you guys have. But so in your high school years, so obviously we talked a little bit about the, you know, the very early time in swimming in your high school years, you know, what was there a point in your high school years where you kind of felt like you started to blossom if, if at all, like, or, or were you guys sort of of the mold that you didn't really sort of get good until college? Cause I really didn't sort of break out until my sophomore year in college. Hmm. Um, I, 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 like I said, I started swimming year round when I was 
10, I broke my first national age group record when I was 12. And I only say that because uh, even at, even just swimming summer league, I was a I was a good swimmer from a very young age, and I just steadily progressed. I never got burnt out. I hit, hit many plateaus, I would say, but never kind of blossomed like like you just talked about, uh, Tyler. So there was never a year. I just got closer and closer and closer to um, you know bigger and bigger goals i think every year and, and set bigger and bigger goals every year and those long-term goals became bigger and bigger um I, I will say though as i see mark on the call too we, i talked about us having to swim against each other when we were younger and i don't even know if mark knows this but when we were like 13 and 14 years old mark you're a year older than me right you're a year uh, old you're older age I think we're the same grade, yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're a year in front of me. Oh, thanks. So, but anyway, you were always a year <laughs> aged up a year in front of me, and I always saw Mark as we competed. Um, he was always just a little bit ahead of me at that age, and I could never envision the day when you're 13. A 14 year old is a lot older, and I could never envision a day where, and I would think about Mark specifically where I could be better than Mark because I was always a year younger than Mark. And so probably the kind of that, that transition was one at one day realizing this happens in college, probably when you get to college and you're all, you know, much more equal, I think, because, you know, a 20 year olds and 22 year old are very similar, um, obviously in growth patterns and everything. But when I was 13, I could never imagine winning, you know, the, a race against Mark and we ended up taking different paths and different strokes, but, um, but I, I, I progressed pretty steadily through those years. Mm -hmm. Good to know. And, and it's interesting because everybody has a different path. Like I, I was pretty, I was pretty average until about 15 or 16. And then all of a sudden I started getting better in sort of the junior national arena, but I didn't really make like my big push to the the national team until I was a sophomore. So it was kind of like two sort of switch steps instead of sort of a linear progression like you. That's kind of interesting. Jeremy, what about you? So where was um, your big breakout? Was it in high school or, or college? Talk about that. Well, I find that, uh, uh, you know, the power of what your mind is, is capable of is probably the, the, the strength of, of what happened to me in my story. You know, um, I was a good swimmer and I did things really well. Uh, I didn't, sorry, Jeff, I didn't even know what a national age group of record was when I was 12 years old, um, but I was good. And uh, I, I didn't swim breaststroke legally till I was 14. It was something I wanted to do because my big brother did it. So when I made the decision to do something like that and committed myself to it, you know, I went from a guy that wasn't legal in the stroke to six years later being the best in the world at it. So things evolved for me based on how I perceived them mentally. And the same happened for uh, you know, so somebody like Gary goes, well, my dad was an Olympian. He's a pretty regular guy. I think maybe I could do that one day. I didn't have somebody like that for me that I un could understand that, hey, this is just a regular person. So I was about 16 years old, and one of my teammates, Anita Nall, made the Olympic team in 92. And uh, and I realized, holy cow, you know, if, if she can do this, maybe it's possible for me. And when that possibility became very real, that's when things really kind of started to change for me. And I was, uh, you know, focused on preparing for and competing on, on more of a, a national and international stage. Obviously, just because I made that decision didn't make things happen right away. I'd work real hard for it, but the belief and the power of what I had in my mind was a really important part and step towards me becoming successful the way I was. 90% mm -hmm. physical, 90% mental, 10% physical, right? Mark, what about you? Yeah, I think I was followed kind of along the same trajectory as Jeff did. Like he said, you know, we ended up going uh, head to head at a lot of meets growing up, going after high point trophies, you know, against each other. And I want to say we made the first junior U.S. team together, like my sophomore or junior year in high school. And I actually made the team as a backstroker and butterflyer and then swam against Jeff in the meet and decided butterfly was much easier for me to train for. So, uh, what? 
<laughs> what? <laughs> I think he's down in the hunter back row. So, um, but yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I I've been super fortunate. I think you know a lot of the success I've had is due to just having great coaches and teammates, and uh, you know, uh, just a calm set of parents that went along with it. it played a huge role. Gary, what about you? Yeah, I uh, had a breakout performance the summer after my junior year in high school. Um, I didn't think prior to that swim that I would be swimming in college. Um, and it was, uh, you know, uh, not getting me to junior nationals and, and one there. And then all of a sudden there was a college scholarship offer. And so I said, oh, this is going much further than I thought it was. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I just kept, uh, kept doing it. I uh, kept enjoying it and uh, stuck with it for a long time. So uh, to kind of, I guess, to add on to that sort of question, you know, when was the first time, sort of a two-part question, but of the same mold, what was the first time you thought maybe I could make the Olympics? And secondarily, when did you think, like, I'm going to, I can do this? Like, it was more of a surety. It was just a matter of time and execution. Um, some, probably sometime around age 15 or 16, I realized, I mean, the, the Olympic trials became a goal. So that was leading into the 88, 88 Olympics. Um, I do know that going into 84, um, Olympic trial, I mean, I was just 14 and I remember one of the kids in the neighborhood betting me that I would make the Olympics someday. And at that point it was just, it was it was, that was crazy talk at, at age, you know, 13, 14. And, and get, you know, remember that for my age group, and this, this is applicable, at least me and Mark, those 84 Olympics in Los Angeles was really our first experience with the Olympics at age 14, because the 80 Olympics were boycotted and the 76 Olympics, I don't think either of us really remember. So, um, that 84 Olympics age 14 was the first time I, you know, we kind of realized what the Olympics was and now, you know, you, you're inundated every four years with the Olympics, which is a good thing. Um, of course, we don't know how this year is going to pan out. We know how this year is going to pan out because we don't know how next year is going to pan out. But um, I, then around age 16, I think it was, I was 16 when I made Olympic trial cuts for the 88 Olympic trials. And so new, knew I had a chance going and at least competing to make the Olympics then. Jeremy. Uh, I think, you know, Jeff hits it on the head. When you make, when you qualify for a meet and you attend a swim meet, I mean, you should go there with the perception that you're going to a swim meet to, to win the race. And that's always was, was, was what my focus was. So when I, you know, I was told not necessarily making Olympic trials wasn't in, that important to me, but I knew I was qualified for the meet. You know, and if I was going to attend the meet, I was going to go to the meet to win the swimming race. And, and I wasn't necessarily the guy that was picked to win that race, but, but because of the, the mindset for preparation, you prepare to win races. So whether it, it's the time or it's, it's the level of effort or beating the competition you're with, that was the focus for my preparation. So, uh, I mean, I think it became very clear to me in, in my belief system when, when a friend of mine makes the team and, and I realized, wow, this is possible for regular guys like me, you know, I'm going to do that. And, and obviously, you know, the, the work that it takes to get there past that is, is a big deal. But I think that has a lot to do with, you know, preparing for what's in front of you. Um, so that was always a big deal for me is just preparing to win races. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting perspective. Mark, what about you? When, when was it like, clear to you like i'm i know i can do this or was it a surprise um i think i got addicted when i made my first junior team for the u.s you know wearing usa on your chest for the first time and walking out in a foreign country and you know a lot of people booing at you but you know you have your teammates next to you who are even tighter because you're in this awkward situation right and so you know coming home from that um i just i think i stepped it up about 120 percent and started really focusing in on how I could make trials and then how I, like Jeremy said, once you get there, then you just kind of drop everything and you're just trying to win. So mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty much where I got addicted. 
So Gary, I know you said you had a uh, sort of breakout performance your junior year in high school. Um, you know, was that sort of the same time in which you were like, all of a sudden the Olympics became a possibility or was it further down the road when you're like, I can do this? No, it was further down the road. The fresh, uh, summer after my freshman year in college, I uh, had another big uh, time drop that uh, put me on the world championship team uh, in 94. And uh, uh, the results from that meet, you know, I was close second place to the Olympic champion and world record holder. And uh, felt only, in, it, it wasn't until then that I really thought I, I've got a real chance of making them. Yeah, because I, I feel like, you know, at a lot of clinics, you know, people ask me, like, when did you feel like you were going to make it or when did you know? And I feel like that answer for basically everybody is different. Right. And, and but I feel like a lot of times when I'm asked that question um, or anytime somebody comes up to talk to me in a in a sphere of swimming, like they sort of put me or any Olympian sort of up on a pedestal. But I want to humanize you guys just a little bit. Um, it always seems to others that, you know, it, it comes really easy to people who've made the Olympics or, or that are just really fast, right? What do you guys say to people that think y'all had it easy? <laughs> do they say that? <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times people were like, oh, well, I'm sure you were just so good from the very first yeah. time that you stepped in the water that it just came naturally when it's so not true. What do you guys say to that? I, I, um, I worked hard and I, I know this is going to be a common theme, but, um, I, there's certainly there's, there's one or two or three or 4% of, uh, of an extra little bit of talent that helps if everyone works the same amount, there's a certain amount of talent, maybe, Mark's lack of cartilage in his knees allowed him to be a better swimmer. I don't, I don't know. You know, my elbows are double jointed in a way that most good backstrokers are. So there's a certain amount of talent there that you can't, you know, some people can't duplicate, but I, I, I worked, I worked hard and I think we all work hard. Um, the number of hours you put in as a swimmer, I think is um, pretty unique in sports. Um, they, they're, they're all work hours. You're not studying film. You know, at least we didn't um, just really study film. It, we were either lifting weights, running or swimming or pulling the power racks or, you know, whatever you do to get better as a summer. It was all physical conditioning for you know, 25 hours a week or more in some cases. So uh, that year I lived in Phoenix, Gary, we were working out. 38 or 40 hours a week that year. Um, that, that was an insane year in, in 1995. So a lot, a lot of hard work. Yeah. And, and I'm guessing that it's going to be roughly the same answer for everybody, but I'm really curious to know, even if it was easy for you, like if you felt like it was easy for you to progress and make the Olympic team, I want to hear that. I don't want you guys to toe the line. I want you to be honest. Jeremy, what about you? Yeah, there's no towing on a line here, but uh, uh, the, the the level of, of work and, and effort uh, that, that you have to put in to swim a 100-meter a race at, at the level that, uh, you know, any of the other three guys on this call or yourself that have put in from the time, you know, if you think about even even – all the moments you put in from, from the time you were a kid to, to the time you were standing on an Olympic medal stand, um, you know, uh, I, I was doing it harder, faster, and more times than, than I thought anybody would ever do. Um, you know, that was my goal is to, to work harder than, than anybody around me or anybody that I could possibly imagine. So that was, you know, the, the key wasn't just, uh, you know, being a talented guy and having an easy road, I was going to earn everything that, that I was going to get. And, and that was the only way, again, for my mind, that I could be sure that I was going to be the one that was going to do it. So uh, I think that, that that level of work and that that effort and that, et that work ethic has got to be there, you know, to put you in that position uh, in between your ears to be, uh, you know, a Jeff Rouse, Mark Anderson, and Gary Hall Jr., 
Yeah. Hard work, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, right? Yeah. Totally. Mark, what about you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's consistent. I think the most tired I ever was in swimming was coming home from national team camps. You know, you have everybody there that's used to winning everything in their practice, going at each other, you know, for a couple of days. And I would literally come home and take like two days off a of workout because I'd be so beat up. But uh, yeah, I think that. But I think also I, I think everybody would agree that, you know, you learn the most off your failures. That's how you progress. So I think every one of us here have failed in a big moment and learned from it. And uh, it made us 10 times better you know, because we took the time to learn from it and didn't throw a tantrum or, or you know, our coach or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So Gary, I, I know you've had some pretty, um, some pretty famous slash infamous moments on deck, you know, your, your level of confidence, as you walked out to the to the blocks, a lot of times made people think of you as being just like this freakishly talented swimmer who didn't really have to put in a ton of work, which may or may not be true. But what do you you know what, what do you see what do you say to the the people who might might say that talent is more important than hard work, especially in our sport? Well, I think everybody here on this uh, conference right now can agree that it was a different time in coaching philosophy and that, that it was, uh, you know, you hammered out a lot of yardage and big volume training. And um, I was always frustrated uh, through my entire career because I did carry a reputation as, as being lazy. And I think this on every single team, it, it didn't matter how hard you worked. If you were a sprinter, you had this kind of sign around your neck uh, as a, a, a lazy because you did slightly less than the middle distance or the distance table in yardage. But um, it was just a different type of work. And I uh, really kind of figured that out, uh, the importance to make uh, the training uh, event specific early on. And so, uh, God, Jeff, thank you so much for reminding me that we were doing 38, 40 hour a week tra you know, training <laughs> sessions. I put in lot of fun. Out. <laughs> yeah, I, I put in a ton of hard work and, and, and hated the, the the fact that you know people regarded me as, as a lazy sprinter, and um, and so um, you know I didn't get fast really until I, I changed that training, um, you know, and, and made it more event specific and maybe was logging less hours or yards in the pool and, and upping the quality of, of the training. So mm -hmm. we've seen the sport evolve since then, where it was just given these huge numbers, and if you can survive it, you'll be good. Mm -hmm. Well, and everyone's everyone's unique too, and so the Gary was able to figure out at a, at a young age the best way to work out for him, and I, and we worked out together for a year, and honestly, I never got it because he worked um, in, in a way that if I if I had worked out that way, I wouldn't have been successful, but he knew himself better than anybody else. And then he was able to transfer that work into performances that just, you know, made you, made your jaw drop. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, to the point of not wanting anyone else at the end of our relay than Gary, you know, in 1996. So, he was pretty, I think, ahead of the curve in terms of understanding what um, kind of the next generation of, of swimmers and maybe the way they were going to be working out. Because um, I don't think those 38, 40 hour weeks would have worked for you, Gary. And you knew that back then, um, which is pretty cool. Well, and that's such a, and it's an interesting point because, you know, I, I feel like there's there's some level of like machismo that swimmers have, you know, in between each other, like, you know, who works the hardest or who puts in more yards or whatever. When at the end of the day, we should really be trying to find out what results in the fast fastest performance relative to the events that we actually do. Right. Instead of just going blindly into this huge voluminous training schedule which, you know, for the most part, it does generally have some benefit to doing that, but that doesn't work for everybody. And that's that's a really interesting point. Um, but to humanize you guys just a little bit more, um, I get asked 
constantly about, um, you know, how to deal with being nervous before a race. Did you guys ever get nervous before a race? And how did you, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, did it, was it kind of a negative thing that you had to control or was it something that kind of amped you up and created that good adrenaline rush? And let's, let's flip it around. Gary, I want to start with you. Uh, I, I knew I wasn't going to swim fast if I didn't feel nervous. Um, I, if I didn't feel sick to my stomach before the race, I know I wasn't going to have a great race. And, um, you know, it, you invest that much time, that much effort into something, you care, right? So it's impossible to walk out there. You can play it cool. Anybody who, who appears cool behind the blocks has a good poker face. But unless you feel those butterflies in your stomachs, uh, as uh, the real exchange is coming in, uh, or, or, or uh, you know, it, it, you've got the, the Team USA, you know, in the stands behind you, counting on you, um, you know, uh, you feel it. Everybody feels it. Mm. Mark? Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's, um, I think the nervousness is telling my body it's time to go, like it's time to get ready to go. And I just, you know, I, I just use the routine. So I would do pretty much the same routine before every race. So that too, let my body know that, you know, it was ready to it's time to race. And so to me, that kind of amped down the bad side of nervousness and like really raised the good side of being nervous. Like your body's just ready to go, all the energy. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Jeremy, what about you? Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like a nervous reaction means that you care about uh, your performance and you care how you're going to do. And it, so if you don't have that, uh, some of that has to do with not caring, you know. But, and then it comes down to how you manage that energy that, that you know, so you care. Your, your body get receives a bunch of energy and now you're just your job is to manage that and i can remember specifically before the 96 uh, uh medley relay you know i'm the young guy on the relay um you know and i'm kind of sitting in a corner of the ready room with my headphones on with my head between my knees trying to stay a little bit calmer because like i said i have a lot of energy and, and i look up and there's these these three guys looking at me who are like, you know, totally experienced, totally having a good time. They might be dealing with their energy in a different way. And they looked at me and they're like, you going to be okay, dude? And I, I think it was a pretty short answer. I looked at him, you know, and and, and said, yeah, I'm going to be just fine. And, and I think it, it, went, it went well once they realized, you know, this guy's just managing his energy right now. <laughs> Jeff, how about you? Were you were you one that was kind of a, a nervous Nelly or not? Uh, I, I had I, I had a healthy amount of nerves. I, I it's been said. I think those neat nerves mean you care, and so um, as long as you're managing that energy, uh, like Jeremy said, it's just fine to have those. Yeah, I don't remember you that nervous, Jeremy, before. <laughs> In the right room. I think just the way I managed it, you know what I mean? It's a little different. You guys seem pretty psyched and pretty relaxed, and that's pretty quiet. Yeah. But, but that's, that's, what um, makes, yeah, that, that's what makes the ready room so interesting is that you go in there and you've got eight different approaches on how to manage that stress that everybody feels. You know, there's some people mm -hmm. that are praying, there are some people that are slapping themselves on the chest, some people jumping up and down, some people blaring heavy metal music into their earphones. Uh, you know, everybody's, some people vomiting in a trash can, um, you know, so, you know, a, a lot of different approaches. I don't think that there's one way to, to manage that stress uh, that works for everybody. Yeah, and that's that's such a, that's an interesting point. And I also want to expand on something. So everybody deals with those pre-race nerves differently, right? But I feel like at a high level, at, at a really high level in the sport, Everybody sort of learned how to get themselves into one of two categories of nervousness that I think that most swimmers especially deal with. I think that swimmers, especially at the lower levels, kind of, you know, sometimes teeter totter back and forth between more of the anxiety based nerves and the anticipate and the anticipatory type of nerves, meaning some swimmers out there, you know, don't do a lot of really pointed preparation for the races. They don't know how many kicks they're going to take off of every wall. They don't know what their breathing pattern is going to be like. They don't know what their race strategy is going to be. All these things that like you and, and, and me all had down pat going into those big races. 
a lot of the younger swimmers don't have figured out. And because they don't have those questions answered, they have all these question marks in their mind. And when they get to a meet, they're like, what the heck am I going to do? Whereas if they've got a lot of this really pointed practice, they, they're practicing in the way that they want to, tr uh, in the way that they want to swim in a meet, they're training the way they want to perform. I find that the athletes are much more likely to show up and be sort of excited more, uh, more on the positive side of that nervousness. Cause they're just excited to be there and, and they're ready to execute. If that makes any kind of sense. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. So moving forward, I, you know, I know we've been going here for 45 minutes. I don't want to keep you guys for too terribly long, but um, what does it mean to you guys individually to be a part of team USA? Which Big question, I know. <laughs> Any one of you, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'll start. Uh, you know, and and in a you know just a poignant moment, and I I want to start because I get to steal it. Uh, standing on a medal stand with these three guys and hearing the national anthem play in front of a uh, sixteen thousand people in your home country, which hadn't happened to anybody in America since L.A. You know. Um, is is a huge deal um and uh and and it really kind of encompassed the entire experience for me there's these flashes that you can almost you know think back and go was that a real moment in my life you know and i i, I think mark was standing next to me and i was holding on to the back of his warm-up so tightly and it's just you know you felt you know, like you were a part of something that was so much bigger than you as an individual. And I think that's the, the biggest deal. That's why such special things happen for American swimmers because of the being a part of something so much greater than just one individual uh, special things happen. And, and for me to be able to represent uh, my country in that way and be a part of what, what that really means was, was a big deal for me. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else want to add on to that? I get asked a lot, you know, what's it like having the national anthem played, I guess, for you. And um, my response now for a very, very long time has been, it's exactly what you think it's like. It's exactly how you imagine it. Because every, you know, in every sport, every kid imagines that moment. It's exactly like that moment. So it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, it, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. So I have to do it with a group of guys that you respect as much as you do. Um, just makes it all that much better. You know, I would honestly trade in, you know, a individual medal for a team medal any day of the week. Just because, you know, we all came together. And especially in this instance, we were the underdogs. So it, was, it made it that much more sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gary, what, is it, what does it mean to you to be a part of Team USA? Uh, you know, we're, we're sold on it from such an early age that, you know, you, you do this for the honor and the glory. And it's the greatest uh, honor uh, an athlete stowed representing the United States of America. And um, to a certain degree uh, within the Olympic movement, it could be argued that it's exploited a little bit. Like we, we, we are, we do sacrifice as athletes in tremendous ways to be able to do that, right? So that's a different conversation. But uh, you can never have swum competitively in your entire life. You watch the Olympic Games, you watch that national anthem being played, and the hair stands up on the back of your neck and on your arms. You get that kind of lightheaded, cloud nine feeling. Um, and and um, that's for somebody that can't relate at all to this very, very long path that has been taken uh, toward this accomplishment. And so uh, it is a dream come true um, to be able to represent the United States. Um, and when you have the satisfaction of, of, of having uh, done that well, uh, there's tremendous pride. And, and, and um, you know, we can, everything today uh, tends to be a bipartisan, something like that. This is one event where everybody kind of puts uh, their politics aside and says, you know what, 
there's a lot of good in the in the United States. We're representing uh, not just our, our, our state or our uh, city. Uh, we're representing everybody here in the United States, and, uh, and it's a great responsibility. It's a great responsibility, and I, it contributes in a big way to some of those nerves you feel before the race. But uh, when when you have the satisfaction of doing it well, yeah, there's nothing better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Mark, you mentioned something, you know, that's that I really kind of connect with myself. You know, you guys were the reported underdogs going into the race. And, you know, my personal connection with that was, you know, in 2012, when I won my gold medal in the Tudor backstroke, I was swimming against Ryan Lochte, who up until that particular race, I mean, he he was and in my mind still is the man in, in the backstroke races and pretty much anything else I swam with uh, with against him. And to go into a race and think, you know, you know, you're just kind of you're, you're going to go out and give it your best and then to have it work out that you end up winning the dang thing makes that even more of a special experience. So with that said, like I want to, you know, without any particular order to it, I want you guys to tell all of us and, and obviously for the people in chat, you know, the, the story of, of that race leading up to it, you know, what the competition looked like. Um, you know, each of your individual perspectives on the race as it was happening. Sure. So we weren't picked to win, that's for sure. Uh, the, the Russian team was, was picked to win over us. Um, they had a really, uh, really strong back end uh, with Dennis Pankatov and Alex Popov. And, uh, and, uh, and, it, it was kind of like, you know, we we're we we're going out there, you know, they told us to go out there and win a silver, and, and it really wasn't our mindset in any way to, to do that. So, uh, you know, I think I don't think it ever crossed our minds that we were going to race to win second place. Um, so, uh, and, and personally, I can say, and I don't know if you guys recall it this way, but the starting blocks we used were very small. Today, the starting blocks are like runways. I mean, they run four or five steps. And we, <laughs> it off. we had these little tiny squares. Jeff didn't have to deal with this. What I had to deal with, Jeff, and I don't think I ever told you about this, was the fact that, you know, I'm standing on that block and you're finishing your second 50, and the announcer's going, this guy's going to break the world record. And there's 16,000 people over here screaming and yelling. And there's people over here and these two guys behind me. And the block's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm looking up in my head. It's like, it would be a really bad time to fall in the pool. Like, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, the only thing that could have went wrong for me in that moment was was fall starting or falling in the pool. Because uh, it was probably the highest energy moment that, that I'll ever live through. Um, and, and to, uh, you know be in that moment and there was no way and in in my race there's very you know my individual race i was very uh you know making sure that i was able to finish the race well i i processed it you know starting out a little smoother and swimming faster and faster as i went when i swam this relay i went as fast as i could the entire time uh you know and i had a great split and all that good stuff but it was definitely a much different race than what i would have planned for if i was doing it by myself and that that had a lot to do with you know wanting to put myself in, in the position to, to uh do everything i did for, for these guys and everyone around us uh, so mm -hmm. that, that's kind of how i i processed everything so jeff how, how did it feel you know coming into the wall and you, you know you broke the world record in the hundred at that point correct um I was a world record holder. I had, I had not, I, I broke it in 92, but I did not break it that week. Gotcha. Okay. Well, even still, you know, you touched the wall first after the, at the end of that leg, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah. Right. Yes. So what were you, what were you thinking when you saw Jeremy, you know, take off over you, uh, you know, were you like stoked with how your leg went? You know, what were your thoughts after you finished? Um, yeah, I was happy with my swim. I went a little bit faster than I did in the individual event. Um, but at that point, you know, I, I think you're, and my whole goal is to get out of the water as fast as I can so I can start cheering. Right. So, um, I, I think what was amazing for me after I finished was watching these guys swim because you quickly do 
the math in your head on their splits. And so you see Jeremy like, holy cow, I can't believe you just swam. And then Mark goes in and you, Mark, you had like a, you're some of your lifetime, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and then you see Mark do the same thing. And then Gary goes in. I, I don't know how much of a lead you had at that point, but when he goes in the pool, you know, I mean, you, your, your split was crazy. I don't remember splits that well, but um, there were just four great races, individual races there. And it just, to me, it just kind of kept getting better and better after I swam because we were getting closer and closer and we ended up, you know, I think you know, we you know, crushed the world record. Um, but uh, it was fun. It's fun to be done and then get to watch, you know, have my part done and then get to watch these other guys go in. So Yeah. Mark, um, you know, as yours, sorry, go ahead. If I could add one thing, one thing to that, um, you know, it, Jeff mentioned being done, you know, the medley relay is uh, the last, uh, it was the last event. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. well, so mm -hmm. it, we were, we were yeah. done also with the competition. So, I mean, no matter how you swim, all of the pressure is alleviated the second you touch the wall. Um, so it, you know, it, it was uh, nice to be you know, like finishing. Uh, this was the last uh, race uh, for, for the meet for us and, and, and just uh, to end it on such a high note. Uh, an incredible week of swimming from all members of Team USA. Uh, it just mm -hmm. was a, a nice exclamation mark at, at the end of a, an outstanding team effort throughout the week. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, when, when you were up on the blocks as sort of the race is shaping up, what do you remember from, you know, before you swung your arms to, to dive in the water? Um, I remember Jeremy taking off like a crazy man on the first 50. And uh, I looked back at Gary like, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> you know, we had a lead, but, you know, I was afraid, you know, I, was this your first national team, Jerry, or not? I mean, Right, swam the Pan Pack game, so it's my first, uh, you know, well, major na uh, national meet. So, yeah, no, and he was, he was amazing. So when he dove in, his first fifty was just on fire, and he extended Jeff's lead. And I remember looking back at Gary because we were both going against the current world record holders in our events, and the guy I was going against at the time, you were allowed to go underwater the whole time, and Russia was in lane two, so I knew I would never be able to see him. So. Um, when Jeremy was coming back, I was like, oh, my God, he's holding on, he's holding on, he's holding on, and he was extending the lead. And when I dove in, um, you know, it just – everything erupted. I'd never heard the crowd underwater before, and it was loud. Like, I heard it clearly. And when I hit the wall at the 50 of my part of the race, um, the crowd just went nuts. And I guess the guy had announced – like, when I watched the race, the announcer said that we were way ahead of world record pace and – so when I was underwater, the crowd got super loud and I came up, it was, you know, almost deafening. And I thought the guy was catching me. So I was from Russia. So I was, you know, pushing it even harder. Going even harder. Yeah. I was racing the underwater camera. I could see the underwater camera. So I was trying to race that and, you know, catch up to it. So um, it's one of the only times I've swum the 100 fly where my last three strokes didn't feel like I had a piano on my back. I felt like I was accelerating through the back end of my race. Hmm. That's awesome. And that I, I I don't have a whole lot of experiences like that because I'm one of those unfortunate souls that swung the 400 IM all the time. <laughs> but I've heard a lot of those, a lot of those type of experiences that must be really cool. Um, so Gary, I'm sure that um, you know most of most of the race was a blur, but talk talk me through the last 50 meters of that race as you were sort of bringing it home. I remember the first 50 meters. So that's, that was the best I really? ever felt in the water. Yeah, I, I, I marked that as, as kind of where, and, and the whole race was a, kind of a euphoric experience. But I, I think there was just a, such a, a great combination of personality uh, among the four of us. Uh, and Jeff, uh, you know, we, we had a, a, a steady hand, you know, the, the calm and collected veteran. Uh, who had been through, you know, these types of experiences before. And uh, I had the opportunity to train with him for years, was mentioned. And so, I, you know, I have a guy that I have a lot of respect for. 
and uh, learned a lot from. And, and, and Jeremy brought the energy. I mean, just that was one thing that he just like was so good at is just you, you felt the you know like yeah the goosebumps uh, in his in his presence before and, and, and the way he harnessed it and, and, and rode that energy and adrenaline like a, a lightning bolt. Um, that one, as it, like Mark mentioned, when we were watching him go, they said, okay, this is this is something special. And then people talk often about a home court advantage. Um, for at the Olympic Games, for the majority of the fans to be on their feet, cheering for us, just at a deafening volume. And, uh, you know, to hear all of that, to be able to share and, and, and uh, just good feelings of, of, of how well these teammates and friends of yours had just performed. They, gave, they made it so easy for me. I mean, I, I had a tremendously diving in, open water, uh, had this huge adrenaline surge from the crowd and, and, and from these guys' great performances. So it was just one of the easiest uh, swims of my entire career. And uh, it just felt like it, perfect, one of those things where you cut through the water like a knife effortlessly just uh seemed uh, magic that's so that's so awesome and um you know i'm sure that's a an experience that all of you hold very near and dear to your hearts and probably always will but uh you know i don't know if you guys are watching chat but i've probably seen 20 to 30 separate uh questions come through asking you know how often do you guys sort of interact with each other now and i think we talked about this a little bit yesterday so when's the last time the four of you had a conversation together, kind of like we are now. Twenty years, nineteen ninety six. Yeah, that's just the race. Uh, yeah, uh, it crossed paths uh, a bit. You know, uh, keep in touch with Mark and, and Jeremy on social media a little yeah. bit, but uh, lost track. Uh, Jeff, uh, quite a few years. So this has been a long time since I've reconnected with you. It's good yeah, to it has been. I think a lot, I mean, summers, I think summers understand maybe, but maybe, I don't, I don't know what the population is on the, on the chat. I assume it's mostly summers, but I think it's easy to forget that we train unless we once and only were on the same college team together, we all train separately and you come together once a year to, you know, for one week or two weeks for, you know, training camp and a, and a national team meet. And so, and then you kind of go your separate ways. Um, uh, Mark and I stayed more in touch throughout the years just because we grew up close together and like we mentioned a bunch of times competed from a young age together. But um, yeah, unfortunately you, you do kind of go your separate, separate ways. And, and one benefit I think of this, this, this lockdown is, is, is events. I don't think this would have happened without um, being locked down. And there were a, a, a couple of times with some, uh, some swimmers have gotten together on Zoom meetings. I, I know that have been organized. So it's been nice to see some old old friends too. But um, the fact is, not not often enough. Yeah, not often enough. And that's sure. that's kind of something that I feel like most high level swimmers would understand, right? Because just like you said, you know, we we all train separately and we all come together once a year for that big meet, or or now, you know, maybe twice a year for like short course world championships or something like that. But kind of the beauty of our sport is that you can come back and see somebody that you probably haven't seen in six months to a year and pick right back up where you left off, which is mm -hmm. um, one of the cool things about what we do. Um, so fast forward now, um, you know, I, I want to kind of wrap it up because we've been on here over an hour. Um, what is life like for you guys now? What are you, what are you guys doing now? What walk of life uh, do you pursue now? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll I'll start. I'm I'm a commercial bank for Wells Fargo. I live in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I'm married. I have two two daughters. They're 12 and 14. Um, they only swim summer league. They do other sports um, uh, that that they enjoy more than swimming. Um, but uh, just live, living in the present, not working out enough. <laughs> um, I, I still swim, try to swim once or twice a week, but I haven't, it's been six, eight, however long it's been now I've touched the water, but, um, but yeah, just simple stuff. seems like. Yeah. Jeremy, what about you? Um, so I've been, 
been a swim coach for for this year marks having been a swim coach for as many years as i was a swimmer so uh come next year i'll be known as a coach and not a, a swimmer um because uh, i've been doing that longer uh i've been with nation's capital swim club in in washington dc uh for for the last 13 years um and, and formerly the, the club that uh mark grew up on so it's, it's a pretty special place to be um you know, a lot of great uh, swimming minds have come together to to create a really awesome atmosphere for, for people to learn, grow, and be successful in it. And I get to be a part of that. Uh, so it, it's really, really a, actually a very special experience to be a part of. And I've always wanted to be able to positively affect as many people as I could. And, and, and for me, the vehicle was going to have to be swimming because I'm not so good at some, a lot of other things. <laughs> so uh you know swimming swimming seems to be the way i can most positively affect uh uh you know young people that are coming up and making decisions for themselves in their life um so i'm i'm really proud of what i get to do i have a, a 18 month old daughter and uh you know the other three guys on the call are like how, how are you doing that right now at, at 44 years old and uh and like Jeff said taking it one moment at a time <laughs> she's uh she's uh, blessed with as much energy as as i had so it's uh it's definitely a fun <laughs> part of that mark what about you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and uh, what is the athlete's village um i am married um two kids uh one's 12 one's 11 they're both lacrosse players um i tried to get them to swim but uh you know they they fell in love with lacrosse early on and uh i live in bend oregon and i worked wall street for about 15 years just kind of fed my competitive side and uh retired about three years ago to start a nonprofit called the athletes village um, which is just a platform, an easy platform where kids from every sport can go on there and ask questions. And we're trying to get pros to answer them. So ex-pro athletes, all three of these guys have been gracious enough. You know, they all give back. They've got a history of giving back to the sport, but they've all been on there and given back and answered personal questions from kids who are asking them. It's, it's, you can easily get to it. It's the athletesvillage.com. Um, again, it's a nonprofit. So you know, everything's free to get on. They just got to sign up. Um, and then I'm CEO of another uh, nonprofit that's building software uh, for people with disabilities and the elderly to help them stay connected during times like this. Very cool. Very cool. Gary, what is what does life look like for you now, now that um, professional swimming appears to be over? Yeah, I've uh, got two wonderful kids, a daughter that's 14, a son that's 12, and they're both into sports, not swimming. Um, they know how to swim, uh, enjoy it, but are just kind of making the rounds, trying everything out. And uh, yeah, I'm a cheerleader for them and uh, do uh, quite a bit of uh, medical consulting work in healthcare, um, work with nonprofit health organizations and get them integrated into larger systems and uh, uh, work uh, particularly uh, in, in, with an interest uh, in, in um, diabetes research and patient advocacy. And uh, well, it's just uh, recently circled back to the pool to start doing uh, a few clinics. Uh, you know, started, uh, I, I, I retired in 2008 and uh, spent a lot of years away from the pool. Uh, not intentionally, never really wanted to like walk away. I'm done with swimming forever. Um, but uh, found uh, a few years ago uh, to, to be missing it a little bit more. For activity, I play tennis regularly um, and I surf a lot and I snowboard a lot. So that's my uh, maintaining health agenda. The competitive stuff I put up on the shelf a long time ago. <clears throat> Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, I think we're going to cut it off here, y'all. You know, you guys, thank you very much once again for volunteering some of your time, especially on a Sunday. Um, it's honestly really, really cool for me to be able to sit down and, and chat with uh, with you guys, because even though um, I was about seven years old, I do still remember uh, my, my mom and dad actually had that Olympics on. We were living in Norco, California at that time, and they had the Olympics on. I specifically remember that relay. And, um, you know, so it's really, really cool for me to be able to connect with you guys on that level. 
Um, thank you so much once again. Um, this was awesome. I feel like um, there's a lot of really good information in here from you guys and a lot of things that everybody in the chat is really going to connect with. So um, obviously, again, thank you. And to kind of wrap it up, everybody, um, you know, obviously most pools are closed, but we are actually getting back to business. There are some uh, pools that are starting to open up. In fact, just next weekend down in Atlanta, Georgia, Coach Brett Hawk and I are going to be doing a clinic. And um, you guys should hop on over to our website at the link that I just put in the chat to check out any other clinics that might be coming up in your area. Um, that being said, we have a whole bunch more webinars coming up this week as well. You can see those at fitterandfaster.com slash live and let us know in the chat what you guys thought about the webinar. Um, that being said, y'all, thank you very much. Um, you have any last messages for the people in chat before we close down? Thanks for coming out. Hey, thanks, thanks for coming. coming. Thank you. Thanks All for right. doing that. All right, everybody. Stay safe, stay positive, and wash your dang hands. Bye now. <laughs> See you. Bye.